Amen. So we're in chapter uh, 17, chapter 17, and we're in uh, verse 6. And we're looking at the fall of Israel. Remember, kingdoms divided. Terrible depiction of Canaan. Okay, You have Israel. And you have Judah. And you have this account in 2 Kings. We've had Elijah and Elisha going around. Uh, a lot of the account has been taking place in Israel with the two big idolatrous places from, I think, Dan and uh, Beersheba, uh, Jeroboam, the sin of Jeroboam. And then, of course, you have Jerusalem and um, the Holy of Holies and the temple and the whole nine in Judah. And we're going to see some kind of some wild interactions between these kings. What we have is Israel going into exile. They're going to go east. And do you know where, who takes them into exile? Assyria does. Assyria was this great big war machine. And so let's look at uh, verse 6. You had this big Tiglath Pileser III. You had Hosea. And, and Assyria is just, this, with this great war machine, is just taking out everyone in the ancient Near East. And now that's come, of course, to Israel's porch. And we have to see that it's not, not happenstance. It's not just, uh, oh, it's Israel's turn. It's on account of idolatry. And so let's look at that and try to understand on what grounds God could do uh, such a thing. So look in verse 6 of chapter 17. <clears throat> in the ninth year, king of Hosea. And so what, what happened, obviously, <laughs> Hosea has already become a vassal of Assyria. Okay, vassal means Assyria is like the big tough king in the region. And if you're kind of a little pipsqueak or if you don't have, you remember the language and um, Jesus talks about if you have a king coming against you, you, know, you better count the cost of war. And certainly Hosea counts the cost of war and he says, okay, well, it's going to cost me my life and all my people's lives. So I'll become your vassal. I'll become your servant here in uh, 2 Kings 17. In other words, Israel is going to be in subjection to a foreign nation, a foreign power. And Hosea, for the most part, will be under uh, Tiglath Pileser III's thumb, or Tiglath Pileser's thumb. And that's what he decides to do. Look in verse 3 here of chapter 17. Against him came Shalamanser, king of Assyria, and Hosea became his vassal and paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hosea, for he had sent messengers to, to sow king of Egypt and offered no tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. So, do you see what happened? Okay. So, this is very important because this is kind of the background uh, context of Israel's relationship with the, their God. What you have is these two kind of covenants in the ancient Near East. You had kind of a royal grant where this king would simply step on the scene and say, I'm going to do this for you. And then what you had was a suzerainty vassal type of relationship where the big tough king says to the little bitty king, so Barry's the big tough king, he would come to me and say, hey, itty bitty king, or I would run to the big tough king and say, hey, can you, can you help me out? I'll give you a tribute. If someone goes to war against you, hey, my guys are yours, we'll go fight together. If someone comes to war against me, hey, you have my back. And of course, I'm paying you taxes and giving you tribute. But at least I'm in this covenantal relationship. And the other opportunity was, of course, when the big tough king show, comes to the little king and just basically tells the king what's what. And the king says, okay, whatever you say, we'll do it. And that's what had happened with Hosea and Shalomancer. Shalomancer made Hosea, which means Israel, a vassal of Assyria, which means there were certain conditions and stipulations, one of which was loyalty. You must be faithful to me. And did you catch what Hosea did there? He did a little uh, behind the back action there. Did you see that in verse 4? But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hosea, for he had sent messengers to sow king of Egypt and offered no tribute to the king of Assyria. So basically, what is, uh, what's Hosea doing? Yeah, he's going down to Egypt, right? It's, which is really telling when you think of God's people. What's so significant about that? They're going down to... Exodus. Yes, the, the place that God delivered them out of with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He's still their God. They're still his people. And of course, they're hard-pressed. And so they're looking like purely like to the right and the left, looking for liberty and deliverance from the very house of bondage that afflicted their fathers generations earlier. Very sobering, right? And of course... How's, this, how's the king of Assyria going to take to that? Not kindly at all, right? And, and so what's behind this? This is just like superficial surface 
political, ancient Near East political treaty level, okay? What's behind all this, what's behind all this and underneath this is, of course, God's relationship with Israel. And if you recall, all the way back in Exodus, okay, you have Exodus 20 through 24. What would happen with these big, tough kings, whether it's Yahweh, the Lord of the hosts, right? Lord of hosts means what? Yahweh, does anyone know? Armies. Like the Lord is the ultimate king and warrior and mighty and powerful. And of course, he has a people, Israel, who are very weak and feeble. And yet God has adopted them and taken them and made him his own. And if you see in Exodus, when we talk about these suzerainty, big, tough king, vassal, little wimpy king, subject relationships. In Exodus 20, the way these, these treaties would go down was there'd be a, like a, a preamble where the big king would identify himself. And you recall in Exodus 20, what does uh, the Lord do? He says, what? I am what? The Lord your God. The Lord your God, exactly. I am the Lord your God. And then there's a historical prologue. Do you remember the next words in Exodus 20? So what's happening here is Israel is in a covenant relationship with the Lord. And this exile seems very capricious, very hard, very unmerciful. Maybe even Richard Dawkins has a little quote here. Listen. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. Petty, unjust, unforgiving. Like a, a capricious, malevolent bully. And you read that, and of course that's like obviously flaming arrows from the enemy of our souls. But if you just look at this stuff on face value, it's like, are they as people? Oh, why is he judging them and bringing them famine and pestilence and drought and now exile and causing you know, their babies to be dashed against the rocks? Why such hardship? And what's behind all that is a big, tough king, the Lord's relationship with his people. He identified himself. I'm the Lord your God. I brought you out of what? The house of slavery. So then the, the king would say his big exploits. I'm so-and-so king. I did this that, and that. Look at me. And then he gives them what? Stipulations. Right? So there's his works of deliverance. Ide identifies himself, says what he's done, which makes you want to trust the king. And then third, here's some stipulations. And you get kind of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments 1 through 10. But then after the commandments are given, there's this wild ceremony where these blood and animal bloods shed. And then there's a covenant that's written up. Stipulations of the covenant. There's two copies. One copy for God, because he's going to forget, no, but one copy for the big tough king and one copy for the people. You remember this? So the stipulations are given, but then they write them down. There's like, uh, you know, two copies, one, two. And then what happens? There's this oath ceremony in blood. I'm sorry, it's getting a little bit low, but you need to see this as the background for this exodus and for God's sobering judgment of his people. He's going to take them into exile. And of course, the first commandment was have no other gods, right? And we see the exile here in 2 Kings. This is 722. So this is what, like uh, almost a thousand years after this covenant went down. But this is in the background. Like we're way in 2 Kings. Exodus 20 seems like eons ago. But this is underneath the surface. This, I am the Lord your God. I did this, that, and another thing for you. Have no other gods before me. Don't worship me in the wrong way. Don't take my name in vain. Keep the Sabbath. Honor your parents, murder, adultery, still I covet. Like, be loyal to me. And they say, here's the tablets. And then they cut up a bunch of animals and, and they're sprinkling blood, Moses is, on the people, on the tablets. And they say, what do they say? All this we will do. They're like, yeah, no problem, God. You delivered us. Thank you for that redemption. This sure beats slavery. You, you're, you've provided for us already, you know, bitter water's been made sweet. Like, yeah, we're, we're your people. You're our God. We will do that thing. No problem. And of course, what do they do over and over and over? Do exactly the opposite. For the most part, they act a fool. And then their, their kings act, the people act a fool. And then he gives them kings. Then their kings, for the most part, not Saul a little bit, David, Solomon, but all these kings are acting a fool. And of course, there's a, they're already in this covenant. And when they act a fool and they're in the covenant, God says, hey, if you obey, you're going to be blessed. Like, you know, kids all over the place. You're going to live under your vine. There's going to be rain and plenty. Um, peace from all your enemies. Like, it's a prosperity gospel if you obey in the old covenant. And if you disobey, what's going to happen? Famine, pestilence, barrenness, like drought, 
foreign armies. And so that's, that's the background here as we're in 2 Kings 16. Like, who can remember way back in Exodus? But they've disobeyed, they've acted a fool, and now it's time to pay the piper. Like, with all their idolatry. And so it's not just, uh, you know, Shalomancer just is fed up with Israel, though he is. Because Hosea is saying, yeah, we'll, we'll be your vassal. Like, Israel itself is a vassal of the Lord who's to be loyal to the Lord. And they're subject to Assyria. They're doing great idolatry in the land. And now he's trying to run to Egypt <laughs> to get deliverance from Assyria. And God says, it's time for the exodus. And so let's look at, let's look at this. Um, we're, we're picking up in there for in verse uh, 4 there. After the king of Israel tries to make a U-turn to Egypt and, and go behind the king of Assyria's back. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to Samaria. And for three years, he besieged it. In the ninth year of Hosea, this is uh, 2 Kings 17. The king of Assyria captured Samaria. And he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and on the Habor, and the river Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. And you, you read that, it's just a couple verses, but think of three years. Besieged is like cutting off water supplies, food, people probably eating their own kids, and starving to death. And it's, it's a terrible thing. It's just a couple lines, and it's gruesome, it's bitter, it's very harsh. And of course, all that happens to all of Israel, per se, but... And all of them, and many of them die, and many of them are carried into exile. And then, is anyone saved, though? That's a question for the class. You, you're already shining this morning. I'm going to let someone else get a chance to answer. Is anyone saved? If everyone's carried into exile and, like, starving, and the city's being besieged, does that mean everyone's going to hell? Okay, good. Someone said no, but, but why not? Go ahead. Very good. And how would this remnant get saved? Would they get saved by um, looking to their own personal obedience according to the Mosaic Covenant? I get that I'm getting carried into exile, but that was because of my neighbor and Hosea's idolatry. I'm, I've done nothing but obey. Is that how you get saved? That's, that seems like a weird question. No, you don't. You get, you get saved according to basically trusting God on the basis of certainly the types and shadows in the Mosaic Covenant, but the, the Abrahamic Covenant. In you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So even though you're, you're carried away with all your idolatrous neighbors, if you're looking to God in faith, mustard seed faith in the gospel, trust in God, sure you sin. Like even though you, you get starved to death over this three-year period and die, like you are delivered and you are saved. So this, this exodus or this exile is a type of almost hell judgment. Do you see that? It's very sobering. Um, and yet... Here's why it happens. Verse 7. Notice the author to Kings is going to tell us why. This occurred because God's capricious? No. This occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. So do you, do you catch that? And that's telling you basically it's trying to gesture you to what? All the way back here. Th that little throwaway line. When you think of God's people, can they all read the word of God? Absolutely not. They're dependent on the priests. And the priests, of course, are setting up high places right and left for the most part and offering up uh, sacrifices to Molech and, and Asherah and other gods. So you, some priests are faithful, but for the most part, they're not really going to know this, this is why. They're just going to say, oh, those Assyrians got us. And so including this verse 7 here, this occurred because the people of Israel sinned against the Lord their God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and feared other gods. It's trying to gesture them back to what? The Exodus covenant, which would, of course, like, how did God become their God? Which would put you further back to the Abrahamic covenant. And so it's like a reminder. And it talks about um, all the other reasons why. But any comments or questions about this exile? The land plays an important role in Scripture. You think of the promise of the land. What's happened here? They're getting taken into what? Yeah, exile. And, and really, a, a good way to think of this, there's so many different layers in the Old Testament, is, is what God has basically done with his people in Canaan. You think of it as like a land flowing with milk and honey. It's like a garden, number two, right? And he, and he puts his people, his corporate people, Israel, in the garden, number two. And then he gives them 
a, a boatload of commandments. And he says, hey, obey and you'll be blessed. And of course, they disobey and what happens? Boom, they're cast out. And so that should remind you like almost a, all the way back to a picture of Adam and Eve in the garden. Does that make sense? Like it's, it's Israel on a national corporate scale for everyone who wasn't alive back in the Garden of Eden, which is who? Most of humanity. And so that land, like not all the world is Canaan, not all the world is Eden, but Israel was to be, you know, obviously faithful in the land and they're very unfaithful. And they're kicked out what? East. 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 And they, they go east. And of course, God is faithful and he's being faithful. That's why they're gesturing back to this. You know, he's the Lord. He delivered them out of the land of slavery, the house of bondage. Here's the commands. You promised you'd do them. And now that you don't, you're kind of hitting the road. And, and so the land, again, is very important because God promised Abraham really three things when you think of it. I'm going to give you the three things he promised. Land, what else? Yeah, yeah. A seed in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then he promised what? Blessing. I'll bless those who blesses you and he who dishonors you, I will curse. Right? It's a beautiful picture. And of course, Abram looks at that and says, hey, Canaan's all there is. This is great. This is, this is it. Abram's, Abraham's looking ultimately to what? No earthly city. Like ultimately, he, he has a sense of, yeah, this is grand and glorious, but there's like a greater inheritance of the whole earth that we await. Like I'm a wanderer, uh, a pilgrim here. And when you think of this age right now, the picture that you have happening with Christ and his incarnation is coming into the land of the whole earth is this end time. You can think of it in two ways. An end time return from exile. Israel goes to Assyria in a foreign land, foreign gods all around, idolatry all around, and they're certainly idolatrous themselves. There's an end time return from exile, which, which all of us in sin, and in bondage to sin, in slavery to sin, um, apart from God's grace, worshiping the truth of God revealed in creation and conscience, and exchanging that for a lie and worship and serving the creation. All of us are in that get down. And what God does in sending Christ is, is enters into time and space to fulfill all the stipulations and bear the sanctions of the covenant, the curse of death and sin that we deserve, and then summons us out of this, um, this exile, this alienation from God, and basically like is, is summoning us to return to the Father. And the other, the other picture you can have, like return from exile, is also an exodus, like an end time exodus right now. People are getting delivered out of slavery and sin and death and coming to the Messiah. And so when you think of the land, it's new heavens and new earth, but this, 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 this exile theme is, goes back to the garden and even is uh, applicable now as people turn to Christ. Any comments or questions before we move on to uh, Hezekiah and his father Ahaz? Let's look at Hezekiah here in chapter 18. This is a great little uh, section here. Um, I want to look a little bit at, at, at Hezekiah's dad, but what we see here um, in chapter 18, and then we're going to jump back to 16 to take a peek at his dad. So we have Hezekiah, very faithful. Very faithful. Ahaz, very sinful. Very, very sinful. Father and son. Father and son. And so Hezekiah is faithful, but let's just look at Ahaz really quick. Turn to, turn to 16. Ahaz starts reigning when he's 20 years, I think maybe 20 years old. Um, it's right around 7, 741 BC. It's a long time ago, okay? And he reigns about 16 years till he's 36. It's a very difficult period in the nation of Israel. When you think of it, why is it a difficult period? Because of their sin and idolatry. And because of their sin and idolatry, there's these foreign kings who are coming up against the nation of Israel. And if you look at Ahaz, let's just look at Ahaz a little bit. In 16 verse 2, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. So you think 20 to 36. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord as God, as his father David had done, but walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. 
Hezekiah. He burns Hezekiah's older brother. He even burnt his son as an offering, according to the despicable practices of the nations, whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. So when you, when you think of high places, hills, under every green tree, you think, oh, well, they have the idolatry covered everywhere. Well, some of that stuff is like a euphemistic language for sexual morality. Because obviously these pagan sacrifices and then the sexual morality often went hand in hand. If you're not going to sacrifice your child, then you're going to engage in sexual morality. Like that's like the code of the gods. Like it's... it's very wicked, very, very dark. And what's happening at this time um, is Ahaz is under a lot of pressure. And this is happening before the exile. And so pressure's really ramped up. Assyria, Tiglath Pileser III, and that war machine are coming on the porch. And Ahaz is an idolater. He doesn't trust God. So all he can look to is what? If you don't trust God, where can you look? There's only one place you can look at yourself or other men or women or nations or political maneuvers. That's all you can look. And let's, let's look what happens here. You have Rezin, verse 5, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Ramalia, king of Israel. And remember, Ahaz is in Judah, okay? And Israel is the one that's going to be exiled in a matter of time. And so Judah's not in quite a bad shape as Israel, but Ahaz is getting squeezed from every side, from the Syrians coming, from uh, Pekah and, and these other kings in Syria. And look, look what happens. <laughs> they, they come up to wage war on Jerusalem and they besieged Ahaz but could not conquer him. So God's very people, his brothers to the north, Israel, is besieging Judah. Does that make sense? <laughs> And Tiglath Pileser III's coming with the Assyrians to take everybody out. At that time, Rezin, the king of Syria, recovered, for, recovered Elath for Syria and drove the men of Judah from Elath, and the Edomites came to Elath where they dwell to this day. So obviously, Ahaz has taken a little bit of a loss there, right? So what does Ahaz do? Verse 7, this is key. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I'm your servant and your son. Come up and rescue me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who are attacking me. So you get the picture. This is just like a throwaway verse. But you have God's very people at civil war. North's attacking Judah. Syria's attacking. And Tiglath Pileser with his mighty war machine, who's like the greatest king of all, is on the go. And he's ready. To, and so Ahaz says, you're not going to go to Egypt. Let me, let me become a vassal of this big bad king. You remember? We talked about that for 10 minutes at the beginning of the lesson. And if he's a vassal of the big bad king, that requires what? Fidelity. Obedience, tribute, exactly. And so watch, watch the tribute that Ahaz is going to give. And any time, you see these kings all the time. They got to give a little tribute. And the first thing they do is they go loot like the Lord's things in the temple. Look in verse 8. Ahaz also took the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and sent a present to the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria listened to him. The king of Assyria marched up against Damascus, took it, carrying its people captive to Kerr, and he killed Rezin. When King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, listen to this garbage. Listen to this. This is amazing. It, it, it goes to show you like <laughs> just the, the pernicious nature of idolatry that there's so many passages in the prophets that talk about, you know, um, cursed is the man who makes flesh his strength, right? I mean, think of Jeremiah 17. Like, whoa, that's like, oh, well, you know, I do that, I don't do that, right? But we all do that to a degree. We all tend to do that. And then, you know, the Lord doesn't take delight in, in the legs, the uh, horses or the legs of a man, but in those who fear him and revere him. And of course, it's utterly impossible. Not impossible, but Ahaz is utterly unwilling to do that because of idolatry and how that's formed his character. And there's certainly things to be afraid of, but it's got to the point that he's going to pillage the house of the Lord. Go give Ahaz tribute, and then he's going to go to Damascus, and he's going to see uh, Tiglath Pileser III and Assyrians. I'll just tell you, I'm not going to read the whole thing, because I want to contrast Ahaz's unfaithfulness with Hezekiah's faithfulness. But he basically sees Assyria's idolatrous altar. He says, okay, that's cool. Hey, priest, make me one just like that. 
throws it in the temple of the Lord and starts offering all this tribute and all this type of worship and sacrifices on it. And so you see like the exchange is so very great. Like as serious as king, his trust, his salvation. Well, now I'm going to worship like that. And God, I'll see you and I wouldn't want to be you. That's the picture. And what happens is a lot of things happen. But what happens is he has a son, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is, is so different from Ahaz. Like radically different. He's, he's beautifully faithful. Look in chapter 18. Look in chapter 18. A, a, you think of Hezekiah. He's 25 years old when he begins to reign. And he, and he inherits like a lot of problems. And there's one picture of Ahaz, I think, before we move on to Hezekiah. You can turn to Isaiah 7 or just listen. There's this, there's this wild picture when Ahaz, right before he, he decides to jump to the king of Assyria, is the Lord calls him out through the prophet. And remember, you have the nation of Israel coming down on him. You have Syria coming down on him. And, and there's this great picture when the Lord calls him. Um, Ahaz loses his heart when he finds out Israel's after him and Syria's after him. And, and look what the Lord says to the prophet Isaiah. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out and meet Ahaz. You and Shear Joshua, your son, at the end of the conduit in the upper pool of the highway to the washer's field. And say to him, Be careful. Be quiet. Do not fear. Do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Ramalia. So, the picture is this. Ahaz is like at a pivot point. Is he going to jump to Assyria? Is he going to get conquered by these kings? Or is he going to trust the Lord? It's an amazing scene. And he says, take your son, Ahaz. And you think of what, what has Ahaz done to his other son? Sacrificed him. And so he's taking his son, the one that he sacrificed to these false gods who obviously haven't delivered him, haven't blessed him. Now he's facing like ruin. And the Lord calls him out and he goes to like this washer's pool. So in other words, he's got like a vision of what's taking place to the north with all these enemies coming up against him. And then a word from the prophet Isaiah. And the, the question is, Ahaz, what are you going to do? Like, what are you, you going to do? And it's an amazing scene here. You can just see the depravity of Ahaz's heart and certainly our own. L look at this. The, the Lord says, don't fear. Don't fear these two. Okay. It shall not stand, it shall not come to pass, basically is the word. And then he goes on to say this. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. That's a great line, isn't it? When you think about it. Because Luther has two, these two great lines about the Christian life. And I'll get to those in a second. But the Lord says, hey, Ahaz, go ahead, ask me for a sign. Ask me for a sign. You've just had my word. You're going to be safe and sound. Don't worry about these guys. They're nothing. Trust in me. Look to me, flee to me. If you're not firm in faith, you're not going to be firm at all. Like, it's up to you, Ahaz. Ask me for a sign. And Ahaz says, listen to his line. It's an amazing line. Ask a sign of the Lord your God, and let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. <laughs> okay, doesn't that seem super pious? Well, I'm not going to put the Lord God to the test. I'm not going to ask for a sign. But what he's doing, do you see what he's doing? He doesn't want a sign. He doesn't want a sign because he wants to be confirmed in his own heart and do whatever he wants to do. If he asks for the sign and then he's given the sign, like he doesn't want it. And he acts like, oh no, Lord, I'm not going to test you. I'll just do what I want. It's sobering. And then of course, that's the great passage, right? The, the sign of Emmanuel, the virgin's going to give birth to a son. But it's, it's so amazing that he won't even ask the Lord for a sign, even though he's commanded to ask for a sign. High as the heavens, deep as Sheol, and everything in between. And instead, he doesn't want to ask for a sign. Now, so often, we want signs, don't we? <laughs> and, and Luther said, whatever you trust in, that is your what? God. Your God, right? And he also said the Christian life is a life of repentance. But I will say to you, the Christian life is a life of invocation. It's a life of invocation. What is invocation? It's, we do it sometimes in the worship service when we quote from Psalm 124. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? What do we say? My help comes from the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And when you say that, of course, there's so much more in there than that, isn't there? Because he's not just your creator and your providential ruler who's orchestrating everything in your life, but he's your what? Your redeemer and your deliverer, the one in whose wings you can take refuge and be safe. 
the one you can flee to and find comfort and protection and be with in paradise should you be persecuted or cut off or cast off. And so I think it's important to keep that in mind. Like the Christian life for you, brothers and sisters, Ahaz doesn't even want to test the Lord with a sign. He doesn't even want to call upon the Lord or take God at His word. He wants to be filled with His own words and His own works. And it's very wicked. And it's very evil. And Ahaz, I, don't, I took his name off, but his son, Hezekiah, is so different from Ahaz. Like, so very different. So I don't know your parents, your spouses, even your own former life before you were a new creature in Christ. But I, I think this contrast between Ahaz's wickedness and his idolatry and his disobedience and his lack of faith, and then Hezekiah, his faithfulness, is such a beautiful contrast. So let's look at Hezekiah, and then I'll make an application or two. Um, look what Hezekiah does in verse 3 of chapter 18. This is Ahaz's son. Remember, <laughs> Ahaz is a piece of work. Hezekiah, verse 3 of chapter 18. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places, broke down the pillars, cut down the Asherah, and broke into pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the people of Israel made offerings to it. It was called Nehashtan. That's a s savage picture, isn't it? He's cutting down all the idolatry. The high places where his younger brother was sacrificed to these foreign gods, he's cutting it down. He's, he's purifying, in a sense, like the land. And look how he's described, though. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For, and this is the line. It's such a beautiful line. For he held fast to the Lord. Like, what a line. You think of holding fast. You know that's the language used for, um, for marriage in the garden. Man shall leave his what? Father and mother and what? Cleave. Hold fast to his wife. Like that is what we're to do, those of us who are married to our spouses. But Hezekiah is described as holding fast to his God. Not carried away in spiritual adultery, and idolatry like his father or like those who are saying, why are you cutting down my high place? I just had a fruitful vine this summer. Does that make sense? Do you think of him bringing reform in that way? Like people are going to love that? <laughs> Probably not. Like what are you doing? This is our protection. This is our trust. This is our hope. And yet Ahaz is being so faithful to the Lord. Like holding fast. Um, and he's described as, as defeating the, the Philistines, which... Really, no one. And I will say to you, hold fast to God, Christian. Hold fast to Him. Cling to Him. How do you cling to God? Jesus would say, if you love me, what? Obey my commands. Yeah, trust, obviously, but and obey. And Ahaz says, um, he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following Him, but kept the commandments that the Lord God commanded Moses. He prospers. He struck down the Philistines. And, and, and as you hold fast to the Lord, I, I really want to remind you, you think of, um, I think of holding fast to Jesus. Like one of the greatest pictures of that is, um, you think in Mark's gospel, remember Jesus is on his way from Jericho and there's crowds everywhere. And there's this, there's this blind guy on the side of the road and there's crowds all over the place and he's, he's blind and he can't see, but he can hear. And he hears that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by and he's like, Son of David, have mercy on me. And remember what the people do? Be quiet, be quiet. They're rebuking him. They're telling him to be silent. And, he, and what does he do? He cries out all the more. He's like lifting his voice. Like he can't see, but he's raising his voice. And Jesus says, call him. What, what do you want me to do for you, Bartimaeus? And he says, no, give me my sight. And Jesus heals him. And you know what Jesus says? You remember what he says to him? And this is what like the, the, the test for us. Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And what does Bartimaeus do? Thanks, Lord. Remember the, the ten lepers that are healed? Only one comes back? Bartimaeus cleaves to Christ. It says, and he followed him. Hey, thanks for my eyes. I'm going to go, you know, eat, drink, and be merry. Right on. No, he, he follows Jesus. He cleaves to Jesus. He walks with Jesus. He talks with Jesus. He's holding fast to Jesus. And Christian, you must do that too. Hold fast to the Savior. 
because go your way, your faith has made you well. What he sees is his way, the right way for him to walk. The way of life is not found in cleaving to other things, but found in drawing near to this incarnate son of David who has saved him, who's healed him, who will lead him, who will guide him every step of the way. And that is what it means to cleave to him. And you're going to be tempted to cleave to this world or material things or illicit pleasure or just the good things being ultimate thing. No. Make the Christian life a life of repentance, but before you can do that, make it a life of invocation. What do you want me to do for you? I want to cling to you. Help me to cling to you. Remember Solomon, what did he pray for? Give me a heart of wisdom. Like, make me... And he turned away from God. <laughs> he became so proud in his own knowledge and wisdom and so overwhelmed with idolatry, he turned aside. Give me a heart that will cling to you. May that be your prayer each day. Help me cling to you. Like Hezekiah, I don't care about my parents or maybe my spouse's sin. Like Take responsibility for yourself. Cling to God. Follow his commands. Hold this Christ who holds on to you, who will guide you. And you know what it says? The sheep will hear my voice. And his voice is always pardoned, cleansed, loved, washed, faithful, mine. Like Those are always like his words. And change, right, too. You know, obviously he's going to call you out. But, you know, cling to him. Hezekiah is a beautiful picture. But notice the temptation comes. Hezekiah is super faithful, but he loses his nerve here. Look how he loses his nerve. It's, 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 it's pretty wild. Okay, Israel's uh, neighbors have just got into exile from Assyria. Okay? So he's seen it, basically. It's like a couple miles to the north. He's like, wow, we're next. And Assyria says, you're next. Look, look what happens. Um, we're going to skip ahead to 14. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, 39 years old here, okay? Get the picture. Uh, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear it. Do you, you see what he's saying? I'll become your vassal. I'll become your, your little servant. Like, he's so faithful, but he, a moment of weakness, right? He, he folds. He, the big Assyrian bully's coming down. This is the kind of bully that, that, like, take your lunch money and you give it to him, but then he's going to punch you in the nose. He's going to hit you again. And this is obviously what Assyria does. Look what he gives him. He loots the temple. Hezekiah gave all the silver, 30 talents of gold, 300 talents of silver. Hezekiah gave him all the silver. Verse 15, those found in the house of the Lord and the treasuries of, this, of the king's house. Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorpost that Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. And then what does the king of Assyria do? Yeah, great. Hey, okay, serve me from afar. No, no, no. He comes right back. He comes right back at him. And watch. You know, and I want you to realize Christianity is not a, like a big shield. You believe in the Lord and you're forever like protected and shielded that you won't face temptations or trials or great tests. It's not what it is. Like, you can still take it on the chin if you follow Christ. You can still lose your nerve and shrink away like Hezekiah. But you can still turn back to God. Day clinging to God is a daily battle. I want you to see that. It's a daily pursuit. Um, strive for that. Otherwise, you'll lose nerve. I'm not saying you won't be forgiven. But life to the full is found in obviously losing nerve and turning back to Christ, but not losing in the first place. <laughs> Of, of being steadfast and having enough resolve to be persecuted for righteousness sake or trusting the Lord in the midst of the big lunch money bully who's coming for you to, to bloody you up. But watch the way. This is the way he overplays his hand. Just four ways real quick. Look at verse 22. This Rob, Rob Shaka is basically uh, the king of Assyria's mouthpiece. And notice the way he's going to test the people of God. It's a, it's, a, it's a political move. Look at this in verse 22. Yeah, I could read the whole thing. I'm just going to read in verse 22, though. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a wager. Like, in other words, he basically says, if no one's stood against Assyria, how do you think you can? And look, Hezekiah has taken down all your altars of worship, which, of course, were idolatrous places, right? This guy doesn't know the old covenant and Israel's religion. What Hezekiah did was faithful. But of course, the accusation, of course, is a religious move. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say to you, you don't want to fake Jesus. 
Like, Paul speaks in Corinthians about people who permit themselves to be, like, punched in the face. And, and there's another gospel and another Jesus. Like, you want a real Jesus. You want a Jesus who is a God of love and of grace, but is, is, is holy enough to call you out in your sin? Who, who, is, who is wise enough to, to give you and empower you with wisdom to make that decision that isn't based on a commandment or a prohibition? Like, you want the Jesus who's going to let you walk in Christian liberty and enable you to pursue God freely and joyfully? Like, don't, don't go back to legalism or false gods or idolatry. Follow, like, the true Christ and the liberty. Um, notice the second temptation, verse 25. Look, at, look what he says. Moreover, it is, is it without the Lord that I've come up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Oh, savage, isn't it? Like, don't ever look for extra biblical revelation. Someone, I remember I was in seminary, and this girl said, uh, you know, the, the, the Lord told me I'd meet my husband the first week I was in seminary. And it was the first week she was there, and I met her, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> this is great. I need to be married, right? You know, she was smart and whatever. Don't go to extra biblical revelation. It's bad, obviously. Praise God I married Beth. That wasn't Beth. Praise God for Beth. <laughs> Praise God for Beth. And that, may that woman be blessed, right? But be wary of extra biblical revelation. Like, stick to the script. Stick to the revealed will of God. Don't go beyond what's written. And don't just stick to what's written. You can be the ultimate legalist. You have a lot of liberty to not sin against God in whatever ice cream you want to choose or what pizza. You know, you got a lot of liberty in the world to play sports, do these things. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here. Look at the, the, next, the next test, verse 28. Then the Rob Shaka stood still and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah. Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. I'm going to close there. <laughs> now, obviously Hezekiah is solid, but Judah's sinful and idolatrous. They deserve exile and judgment just as much as Israel, basically, almost, okay? But once, once this guy starts like stepping on God's toes and claiming that he's God and the great king, then you know God's going to have the back of his people. And so don't... don't don't let Hezekiah deceive you. Like, don't ever let Satan accuse the word of God to you. It's always true. It's always good. It's always right. It's always proper. It's always right for you to obey it. It's always the very best thing for you to do to obey it, no matter how you feel. And don't let Satan accuse God's character to you. He is way more loving than you could ever imagine. Way more willing to forgive when you stumble. Way more compassionate to come and lift you up. And don't let Satan accuse you and your conscience, right? That you aren't Christian or that you're not saved or that you're not good enough. Like, you're in Christ. And because you're in Christ, you are God's. And so be careful of these accusations, but also see Hezekiah's faithfulness. You can come up with all the excuses about the things you used to do and why you are still the way you are, who your parents were. Forget about all that. Like, it's part of you, I get it. It's not that I don't care. But, you know, press on to cling to God. Cleave to Him. Hold fast to Him like Bartimaeus this week, beloved. Let us pray. Father, thank You for uh, Your Word in Second Kings. And, uh, Lord, we covered a lot of ground. I speak way too fast. May You, through Your Word and Spirit, drive home to our hearts and the depths of our souls to make this a week of invocation, to call upon You, um, to cry out to you, to give you thanks and praise and, and thanksgiving. Thank you for our great salvation. Help us to, to follow your commands and to live lives worthy of the gospel. And, and now, Lord, prepare our hearts to, to hear from you and speak to you and, and be changed by you as we gather for worship as your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.